So we're going to talk about the burnt out pursuer who is tired of chasing and how do we help them? Welcome to Foreplay Radio, Couples and Sex Therapy. I'm Lori Watson, your sex therapist. And I'm George Fallon, your couples therapist. And we are passionate about talking about sex and helping you develop a way to talk to each other. Our mission is to help our audience develop a healthier relationship to sex that integrates the mind, the heart, and the body. So we have another mailbag, basically a person writing to us who's a burnt-out pursuer, a female, and she says, My husband and I, we've been together for 19 years, married 16. We married so young that we're now both nearing 40. In our relationship, I've always been the one who has been more sexually charged. My husband has always been on the side of sex needs to happen naturally. So over time, we've gone from sex two to three times a week to now sexless, basically the last two years, and completely celibate the last seven months. Woo! In our relationship prior, I would say that both of us were equal in our initiation of sex, but in the last three years, I'm the instigator 75% of the time. I've been feeling hurt and rejected, and I've talked to him about this about three times over the last 15 months. Now, that's not a really bad pursuer, only three times in 15 months. He always says he's sorry, but he hasn't had a drive to have sex. And he tells me, if I want it, I should just tell him to turn off the television. That's sexy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but as always, my husband is very closed off in communication. It was way better when we were younger, but over time it's gotten to where we don't even talk about any issues at all. Honestly, I think we've just become friends and raised our children. I got so tired of feeling neglected and unwanted that I've taken to no longer initiating sex, which is why we have now been celibate for seven months. He tells me he loves me and gives me hello and goodbye kisses but I feel so rejected. And in the last bit, he has mentioned my weight gain as an issue, but he swears now that that's not a problem. I asked him about pornography, and he even says he has no desire to look at that. I resorted to masturbation, and there's no other sexual release for me. Basically, she's saying she's not having an affair. On a side note, we've always been vanilla. I used to send dirty texts, dress in lingerie. I got no response, basically, again, saying I've done everything. I would love to try new things like role play, but I can't even get plain old sex on the radar anymore. In my recent withdrawal, I've tried to isolate myself and drink wine nightly instead of going to bed with him. He doesn't seem to mind as long as he's always entertained by the television. I've contemplated leaving almost every day for the last year. I feel so abandoned, but I know I'm abandoning him too. I just don't know where to go from here. Ooh, painful. Oof. So painful. We also had another letter from somebody after our first couple of podcasts who was a burnt out pursuer who said, you know, I have talked softly to him. Right. I have approached lovingly. I do try to get underneath his skin in a way that is gentle and soft and loving, and it still doesn't work. Right. You know, sometimes, and we want to help people as best they can, because I still often, when they come in, can see ways that they could potentially get through to their partner. I mean, I think that's what I do for a living, right, Right. is how do you get through? But then there are times when a patient comes in and either maybe working with them for a period of time or I listen to them and, you know, they have really tried everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And certainly with sex, if your partner doesn't pick up their socks, you can hire a housekeeper. You know, (laughs) if they're not a good cook, you can take out. But with sex, if you're committed to fidelity... That's a really tough one to do the takeout on. The research is pretty clear on this. When the pursuer starts to give up, that's Mm -hmm. a really bad sign for the relationship, Mm -hmm. right? So, yes, I trust pursuers are usually working harder, reading more books, trying to do things to get it to work, but you can't clap with one hand, Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I certainly believe it's all of our birthright to have sex, to have somebody connect with us, to be emotionally, physically, spiritually Mm -hmm. connected. And if you're not getting that... Especially if that's the promise, right? Right. I mean, most of us marry and make a promise onto sex. It's not just being faithful isn't just staying away from others. It's, It's promising our partner that we're going to be erotic with them, that we're going to have a sex life with them. It's fidelity is a sword that cuts both ways. For me, it's playing the percentages. What I mean by that is you don't, when pursuers 
start to withdraw because mm-hmm. they don't want to be rejected anymore and they're sick they're of tired. fighting and tired yeah. and frustrated, then sometimes it feels in the short term things improve because there's less fighting, but it's actually embracing more distance. So I'm trying to continue to encourage pursuers to persevere. Like what they're fighting for is the right fight. They're wanting more in a relationship, that they're willing to put in the effort is beautiful. That often they just need a voice and some reassurance that says, keep going, right? And yes, it's helpful if the way they keep going is recognizing how challenged their partner is in in engaging, to kind of recognize, to take it less personal, that they're trying not to do emotions, not because they don't want you, but because they just don't like how it feels for them. Right. So that that kind of takes a little of the sting out of the attack of the pursuer. But I don't want the pursuer to stop trying to stop coming forward because then where does that leave us? Nowhere. There's no energy. There's no energy. When the pursuer backs up, there's no energy for the system anymore. Exactly. Oftentimes. And rather than I think the instinct is to say, you know what, I'm gonna give you a taste of my own med- of your own medicine. Sure. I'm gonna leave you the way you've left me. I'm not going to try anymore and just see how you like it to be so lonely. And they're and hoping left that out. motivates the person to, you know, right. try again. And, and sometimes when there's been a lot of pressure, that space does open up and the partner does respond. But sometimes it provides relief and the withdrawing partner just says, whew, off my back. I see that right. especially with sexuality. When the sexually pursuing person gives it up and just says, okay, I'm never going to ask again, the partner doesn't automatically come forward and say, oh, now I'm I'm really in touch with my desire now that I've had a chance to get in touch with my desire. They say that. Right. The sexually withdrawing person always says to me, well, you know, I I can't initiate because I don't get a chance. But then when there's a three-week break, did they initiate? No. It's like, well, you know, I got busy, you know, the kids were sick, this, that, and the other. And it's like, I can always count six times that they could have had sex and they didn't. The you pursuer know? is keeping score, that's for sure. <laughs> well, you right. know, for me, the recipe is the same for both partners. I always want to keep this simple. Okay. Right? Then we talked about this in another podcast. If there's a, a problem, we want to listen to the signals, right? And we need mm-hmm. our partner to be able to respond to those signals. So if you don't want to have sex because you have this pressure, you're afraid of failing, we want you to be able to express that so you could have some success. Same thing with the pursuer. They need to talk about their frustration and their fear of when they keep trying and they keep feeling rejected, Mm -hmm. right? They need their partner's responsiveness. They need to be told from the therapist to understand themselves that what they're doing is natural and healthy, and it sucks when a person won't meet you there, Mm -hmm. right? What can be more rejecting than wanting to be I mean, that's just the first wave when you want to connect and your partner doesn't want to connect. Now here comes all of this second wave of shame and what's wrong with me? Am I attracted? Did I say it right? Was the right time? I mean, the tapes that play in a pursuer's head is pretty horrific. Right. right? And it's they don't like, get help. Yeah. And it's like she's trying to make sense of this. Yeah. Right. In this this letter to us, she's saying, well, could it be my way? You know, he says it, it wasn't, but it sounds like she's had a history of sexual rejection for a long time. Maybe the weight is secondary. So how can we help her say it, talk about her defeat without necessarily, I mean. It's so important because we can't talk about this with our friends, right? We can't talk about this with family. We have nowhere to go with this. Just that she could hear us saying she's doing everything right, Mm -hmm. right? She's trying to get closer to her husband. That's where we're supposed to be in a marriage, that what she wants is more. It's it's so healthy. sex is so important. Right. She should want sex. Right. I'm so glad she still wants sex after 15 years of rejection. This but how woman's nice in it would for that the... hear for her to hear that from you, that it's yeah. so nice that she hasn't given up. She's still fighting for the relationship. We don't want pursuers to hear the message that they're too much. Yes, we want to soften how they fight, but we never want them to stop coming because that is the energy we need to make a relationship thrive. Yep. So, again, we're trying to get curious about what's stopping her partner from engaging. We talked on an earlier podcast, the brain, the heart, the body. How engaged is he in those three different areas? Can we kind of, if he's refusing to answer questions or to read books or to engage in a process, 
then where does that leave her? I mean, I think she she needs to hear that she has a right to stand up and say that's not okay. That's not acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I hear this particular scenario, not necessarily generically, but okay, he's also not looking at porn. Either he's lying and he is diverting his sexual energy, Mm -hmm. which I hear a lot too, or he doesn't have any kind of sense of desire inside, in which case in his body, his body is shut down. I'd absolutely put my foot down and say, you're going to the urologist. You got to take a test. We got to find out if your testosterone is adequate because when he's this age, 15 years into a marriage, there's something wrong if he's truly not engaging sexually anywhere. And I would encourage you to say it in a way that was less in that angry tone and more in that vulnerable tone that says, because I can't get you to engage, I start to go to some really scary, painful places in myself where I start to feel not attracted, not lovable, that I don't like myself. I start to hear old messages from when I was younger. Like her partner probably doesn't know any of that's going on, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's that doorway into vulnerability that this pursuer is still trying to say, hey, listen, this ghost is coming for me when you won't have sex with me, when you won't touch me. And if you're not willing to fight this ghost with me, all of these fears and pains, then where am I at? Okay, and so what if, what if, and this is the burnt out pursuer, what if she's done that? Let's come back and talk about at what point, after putting her heart out so many times, at what point does she keep her heart to herself? Speaking with certified sex therapist Lori Watson from Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Lori, what is an intensive? So an intensive is 12 to 14 hours of therapy all in one weekend. And it's a way to really make fast progress compared to weekly therapy. I mean, there's just so much more you can get done when you have a chunk of time. Overcome the challenges in your relationship and your sex life. Learn more about intensives and Awakening Center's other services at awakenloveandsex.com. Hey, I want to let you guys know all about George. He's written and contributed to several books, and I'd especially like to draw your attention to his book, Sacred Stress, a radically different approach to using life's challenges for positive change. His book is about a mission on how you adopt new strategies and turn stresses into a positive force in your life. And who among us doesn't live with a lot of stress these days? We'll keep you posted as to all he's doing. But George and other EFT therapists all around the country and the world hold couples retreats called Hold Me Tight, which is developed by Sue Johnson, and it helps secure your own relationship. If you'd like therapy with George, find him at georgefowler.com. So I know you said, don't say it in such an angry way. True. But it's human I mean, to say have you ever tried to get a man to go to a doctor, George? I mean... Hey, listen, I appreciate you just trying to reframe it because sometimes we just say things and the ideal, I'm always shooting for a target. We have the best chance of success when we say it in a way that's softer and it's about me instead of about my partner. Sure. Right. But it's pretty human when you've tried 10 times and you've been rejected to get a little frustrated and say you want to shake your partner. So I'm not telling pursuers they're wrong if they do that. I'm just saying it's going to be less likely that that's going to be successful. Mm Mm-hmm. True. Right okay, in. so so it's the tenth time that you've said, you know, hon, something's going on, you know. You don't have morning erections anymore, I've noticed. And, you know, Lori says that that's a big sign of lack of testosterone. And you seem a little depressed and you'd maybe feel better. And I want you to feel better. And I want us to be connected sexually. And I want you to want me. And she goes through all that. Okay, this is session 10. Right. You know? well, now what is she going to do? Vulnerability demands your partner has to earn the right to your vulnerability. We earn the right by responding. This is your other book you need to write. I just want I want us to note this because okay. I think this is a really important point, but you have to like write a book about it. Okay, keep going. If your partner doesn't respond to your vulnerability, then that earns mistrust. So I'm not going to pour my heart out 10 times in a row just to be rejected each time. Your partner's going to have a few, and each time your partner doesn't respond to your vulnerability, that's what's going to create more and more of that distance. So if, you, if you've reached a point where your partner has rejected your vulnerability, mm-hmm. then you have to stand up for yourself and say, listen, this is not acceptable. We can't have a viable relationship if you don't want to engage me. 
And some yeah. people, I mean, I think that's going to lead us into why 20% of couples are considered sexless, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of complications, right? There's, there's extended family, there's kids, there's community, there's careers, there's money. There's so many things that people might decide to stay in a unit, even though they're, they're not being physical. I'd still want to make that more explicit because, I mean, wow, to, to have a life of little touch and emotional connection and safety and that spiritual connection, that intimacy, just because somebody's not willing to face their own pain and fear, right. that's, that's not okay. That's not okay. It's not. That's too painful, right? Babies die when they're not touched. Right, it's pretty, you know. Yeah. I mean, it is... It is what partnership is about, is the physical as well as the emotional and mental. I mean, it has to be, yes, it's fantastic that we raise children together and partner, but it has to be something special and unique between us if that's what we've pledged. That's right. And that's who we're speaking to. And it's unfair if if we're in a relationship with each other and I'm willing to respond to your vulnerability and show up for you in your pain. But when I show you my pain, you won't show up for me. How is that okay? It is not okay. It's not. So they, to, all these pursuers need to hear that that's not okay. That that doesn't make you a bitch or a jerk because you're dissatisfied with that. Your body's going to communicate saying, wait, this is not where you're supposed to be. You're not supposed to live in this place. You can't repair, which means your nervous system is getting stuck in distress and isolation, which is not a, a healthy place to live. Exactly. It's shut down. So are we saying that they have to give an ultimatum and say, I need out of this? Yeah, I think you, I, that's everyone's personal choice. I mean, I think I work pretty hard to keep marriages or Me relationships too. together. Absolutely. Right. But I don't ethically believe encouraging somebody to stay, even though their needs won't be met. If that's a choice they want to make for themselves, they can make that. And I think then they'll turn towards friends, towards church, towards different places to kind of get some of those needs met. Mm. And for some people, if they choose, that's the life they want to leave. Mm -hmm. But I still think... And certainly people make those decisions. Right. They decide to forego sexual connection for the sake of the partnership for their children is the one I hear most frequently. I don't think that's weakness. I think that is... That's That's strength strength to be able to say, I'm willing to lose in parts of me just to keep everything else kind of afloat, right? Uh But it is, it's tragic because it's a loss. There should be some mourning of that. And, you know, I haven't had that happen too often. I think most of the time, if you keep, if you have a message, if you love your partner and you see their pain, it should prime that pump to get you to respond to your partner. If it doesn't, that's a bad sign. I mean, sometimes people's hearts numb out. They're not willing to do it, mm-hmm. right? And then I think that you or, have- Or they're too, they're not capable. I mean, oftentimes they're too damaged, their own childhood, too repressive, to shut down. One of the things I think that I've seen and is the most familiar with a person who's shut down sexually is that when they were little, they didn't get enough touch. And all little children mm-hmm. need a ton of touch. Right. And so- at some point, as a little child, they decide, I'm just not going to need touch. I'm not going to need that because it's so painful to me for my body, literally as a child, to ache to be touched that it hurts me. It is literal pain to not get that. And so they take that vow as a child. And maybe they go through periods of time in adulthood, you know, hormones are high, they have sexual encounters and, and, they experience that, but then in attachment, in later marriage and partnership, it's like all that fear of needing mm-hmm. comes up again, and they just say, I, I can't do it. And so they shut it down. And right. I think if your partner is that damaged, the blessing would be they're married to a person who sexually pursues them and is offering them all this touch, wanting them, craving it, supplying all that energy sexually for the marriage. Right. But then if they can't partake of that, and the person wants it to be sexual and wants to stay within their own ethics of, I've made this commitment, then I... vow. Yeah. If they've made the vow and, yeah. they, and they believe that, then I think they do have to confront their partner and say, this is not a marriage. We committed to 
a sexual partnership as well as a, a life partnership. And so this is essentially, in my mind, the partner is breaking the vow of fidelity. The the sexually withdrawn partner has broken the vow of fidelity. And they might have really good reasons, right? There might be trauma or there might be... I remember I was doing, I was training therapists somewhere doing a live session with a Navy SEAL who started the session off by telling me, some people say they don't do emotions. Mm. I want to just let you know I don't have any emotions, mm. right? So again, this was going to be somebody difficult Perfect to connect Navy with. Perfect Navy SEAL. Vulnerability, great. Yeah. You know, when you understand the family of origin, he was in foster care and never saw secure attachment and right. never had people. And that really worked well for being able to turn off feelings and what he did professionally. But his marriage was a disaster. There were affairs, addictions. I mean, you name it, things were gone because he didn't know how to do this. Right? He never, didn't get a book. He'd never gotten it. Right. So, and I He'd was never trying been to cared for. Really. I was trying to get some emotion, try to get nothing, nothing, block, wall, stock, nothing. And then eventually I said, oh, but you, you, you have a daughter. Tell me about your daughter. And something kind of shifts in this man. Mm, yeah. And he says, oh, Mary. She's six years old. She's the most beautiful thing in the world. And at night, I sit down on the bed next to her, and I read her a story about knights and dragons. And I'm her knight, and I'll protect her from anything. And I read her this book, and I rub her hair, and I give her a kiss on her head, and she falls asleep. How the heck does this man know how to do this for her? Right. Nobody's ever done it for him. So again, that's the hopeful so, message that it's hard to do this stuff, but, but we're resilient even, as humans. There is a part. Exactly. It's that even wants harder connection. not to. Yeah. Oh, that's that's beautiful. Well, go, yes, it's this longing that we're just trying to tap into. So I get how frustrating it is for pursuers when they can't tap into it. Right? That is our birthright to tap into somebody else that wants to engage with us at that level. And you can be empathetic and you can be supportive, but eventually you keep leading this person to the water and they're not drinking. You know, you have to be able to stand up and say, hey, listen, what's stopping you? We're not having a life we were meant to be because you won't face these fears. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard, but I'm here to help you with it. But I need you to fight for us. Mm -hmm. Right. And, And their partner needs to step up for them. They do. They do. And if they don't, sometimes it means that the partnership is over. And and I don't like that answer. I know our people don't like that answer because they love these partners. Right. You know, and, and I guess I'm I, more hopeful. I, I think there's a way. That person who's not engaging, they're hot. They they want it different too. They just don't know how to do it. The fears have just kind of made the world a very small and narrow place and they just look towards T V or little outlets to kind of feel some sense of engagement. And I agree with you as a therapist. I do. I have yet to see a couple ever that I didn't see the path. Right. I've always seen the path. I've always seen what was possible, even for the most shut down person, like how if they could just do a little bit of vulnerability, how it would open them up and heal them. Right. I mean, heal these deep places. Yeah. But I, I do, my heart does go out to this woman who's saying, you know, I've I've been waiting 15 years for this to happen. and And she's not... I mean, if she's only talked to him three times in 15 months, you know, she's not beating him over the head with it. If a couple is stuck in a negative cycle where the pursue is critical and angry all day and the withdrawer is just shutting down all day, Mm -hmm. both of them are losing, right? So if if a pursuer wasn't willing to go softer and was continued to feel righteous in their anger and their contempt and their criticism, I would tell a withdrawer, you need to stand up and say, that's not okay. Why should it be any different to a pursuer? If they can't get their withdrawal to re-engage, they need to stand up and say, that's not okay. That's right. You can't change a negative cycle without both people. The thousands of couples I work with, I never met one of them where they didn't both do it together. Yeah. And maybe that's what we say to this woman. First step would be seek out a therapist. Seek out somebody who understands attachment. This way of thinking about relationship, that there's a push and a pull because maybe the leverage of the therapist, the third party who can help your partner maybe see it in, mm-hmm. in a new way, that might be helpful instead of just giving up, seek out help. Right. And what I want to say is, I'm sorry your partner's not in a place to see what you're trying to do, but what you're trying to do is beautiful. And I'm sorry that you haven't been seen all these years for your effort to love your partner and form something that is deep, sexual, intimate, emotionally connected. Right. 
we feel for you. Thanks for listening to 4Play Radio. And 4Play family, I want you to know we had our highest download day ever, thanks to you. Our downloads are just increasing by leaps and bounds. We are so grateful for your sharing. Thank you again. Definitely subscribe. That helps our rankings in iTunes, which is important for us. Call in your questions to the 4Play Question voicemail. Dial 833-MY4PLAY. That's 833, the number 4, PLAY. And we'll use the questions for our mailbag episodes. All content is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for therapy by a licensed clinician or as medical advice from a doctor.